It's a great pleasure to have Yasmin Yazidi presenting today's seminar. She's a postdoc at the Imperial. Uh, we lost her to Imperial in the competitive world of postdoctoral physics. She got a better offer there. So, so it's a great pleasure to have her present today's talk and she's going to tell us about uh, entanglement entropy and related things. You're, um, um, I forget the exact title, so please, once you're ready, yes, man, share your screen. Okay. Everyone can see the slides? Yes. Okay, so yeah, th thank you for this opportunity to give a seminar. The, the pleasure is definitely mine. Um, in this talk, I want to give an overview of entanglement entropy in terms of space-time correlation functions, which is something I've been working on for the past few years. I'll discuss why it's important, and I'll highlight some work that has been done in this context. And I'll end by mentioning some of the future directions um, in this context. So I'll, I'll begin with some general remarks on entanglement entropy. Then I'll review a spatial, i.e. on a fixed time slice, calculation of entanglement entropy applied to a chain of harmonic oscillators. Then I'll motivate the need for a space-time definition of entanglement entropy and the UV cutoff, which regularizes it. And I'll review a formulation of entanglement entropy, which admits these. And then I'll summarize some results from the application of this space-time entanglement entropy to a Gaussian scalar field, both in continuum geometries as well as in discrete causal sets. And as I mentioned, I'll end uh, with discussing some future directions to pursue, as well as specifically um, some ex extensions that have been made um, to interacting theories in this context. So let me start by introducing the concept of entanglement entropy. Entanglement entropy is a measure of our limited access to a quantum system. This limited access could be for different reasons, for example, due to the presence of an event horizon, or due to experimental limitations, or because of some other coarse graining. And conventionally, it's defined using a density matrix rho, which is initially pure, meaning that we have full information about the system and the entropy is zero. And then later on, one traces out of the density matrix the parts of the system that one doesn't have information about. And typically the system is considered on a spatial hypersurface stigma, like in this figure below. And it's divided into two complementary subregions, like uh, region A and region B in this figure one of which represents where we have access to or have information about, and the other one where we don't. After we trace out the degrees of freedom in one of the regions, we get a reduced density matrix. And then the entropy of entanglement between region A and region B is defined as this um, expression in terms of the reduced density matrix, in this case, rho sub a. Uh, so it's defined as minus trace rho log rho. And we get the same answer whether we trace out the degrees of freedom of region A or region B. This is called the complementarity of entanglement entropy. And it's also related to the fact that this entanglement entropy is not an extensive, i.e. not a volume-dependent entropy. It typically scales as the spatial area of the boundary between the two regions. And this is what's referred to as the area law of entanglement entropy. The boundary shared by um, the two regions, um, uh, the, the boundary is the thing that is shared by the two regions. And the entropy had 
to have such a um, dependence for it to be a property shared by both of the complementary regions A and B. Entanglement entropy is one of the leading candidates to be the fundamental origin of black hole entropy. And it's what historically started the whole idea of entanglement entropy. We know that classically black holes have the Bekenstein Hawking entropy associated with them, which is proportional to the area of the event horizon but we don't have a good understanding of the fundamental nature of this entropy. For example, in the statistical mechanical sense, we don't know what the microstates leading to this entropy are. Now entanglement entropy as first shown by Raphael Sorkin in 1983, generically obeys area laws. So it's, it's a very natural direction to pursue in order to understand uh, black hole entropy. And similarly, the entropy of cosmological horizons, which share many thermodynamic features with black hole horizons. We know that uh, matter fields will anyway contribute to the total entropy. The question is whether their contribution, for example, via entanglement entropy is the dominant one. And since this original work in the context of black hole entropy, Entanglement entropy has proven to be a very rich topic with various useful applications in other areas of physics in the past few decades. In general, in quantum gravity, entanglement entropy is believed to hold key insights, especially with how it has both geometric and quantum properties. And under certain circumstances, for example, in these works of Ted Jacobson and Mark Van Ramsdonk, suggestive links have been shown between entanglement entropy and Einstein's equations. In quantum field theory and ADS-CFT, a number of interesting theorems have been derived using entanglement entropy. For example, C theorems, which say that there exists a positive real function of the coupling constants of a quantum field theory which is non-increasing along the renormalization group trajectories and stationary at the fixed points where it takes a finite value proportional to the Virasoro central charge. In ADS-CFT, Ryu and Takayanagi found a relation between entanglement entropy and areas of minimal surfaces the entanglement entropy is said to be equal to one quarter of the area of the minimal surface. And it has since been proven first in special cases and later in general. In condensed matter physics, uh, features such as topological order and properties of Fermi surfaces have been studied using entanglement entropy. And in quantum information, entanglement entropy is used to constrain things like teleportation and to study properties of states. Also features of entanglement entropy um, are used in the study of firewalls, which are related to the black hole information paradox. And this is of course not an extensive list of applications. Here is just uh, along that along the same topic. Here's a plot of the number of papers per year with entanglement entropy in the abstract from archive. So there's been a growth of papers in the past decades and in the past few years there have been around 300 papers a year, which is a lot. And 2020 is not over, so this this point is going to go up as well. Uh, so there are numerous um, papers on this topic in, in different fields and it's uh, an important current subject. Now there are a number of uh, different ways that this um, entanglement entropy expression minus trace rho log rho is computed. For example, it can be numerically calculated on a lattice or in a spin chain in either real space or as a mode expansion. 
this is often done in condensed matter systems. In, C in conformal field theories, a trick called the replica trick is used a lot because it turns out to be easier in many cases to compute powers of the density matrix and then take the limit going to one of this expression derivative with respect to um, n of the trace of rho raised to the power n and this would give us the entanglement entropy. In holography, as I mentioned, we have the Ryu Takanagi formula, which says that the entropy is proportional to the area of the minimal surface. There are also methods for computing the entanglement entropy using the Euclidean path integral. For example, these methods are sometimes used in interacting quantum field theories to compute the entanglement entropy perturbatively. There's a formulation in terms of spatial correlations and I'll review an example of this uh, later on. And finally, there's a recent formulation in terms of space time correlation functions, which is the main focus of this talk. And again, this is not an extensive list, but it's just a number of uh, common ways for computing entanglement entropy. Now let's look at a conventional calculation of entanglement entropy in a 1D chain of harmonic oscillators with nearest neighbor couplings. I'll be following the procedure laid out in this um, reference below. The Lagrangian for our chain of harmonic oscillators is given by this expression. We have a Q dot term, a Q square term, and a term with the couplings. K is the coupling strength. And in terms of the spatial UV cutoff, which is the spacing between the oscillators, which I'll call A, K is one over A square. We'll need the uh, square root of the potential in this um, calculation, which I'll label as C. Now let's divide the chain of harmonic oscillators into two complementary subchains whose entanglement we'll be interested in. And let's label the oscillators in one subchain with Greek letters and the complement with Latin um, indices. It's convenient to rewrite this uh, C matrix in terms of blocks corresponding to these two subchains like this and it's inverse. And we'll also need the inverse of each block, which I'm gonna show with uh, tildes. When the initial state rho was the ground state of the system of harmonic oscillators, the reduced density matrix associated to a subchain, let's say the, the one with Latin indices, can be expressed um, by this expression in terms of these uh, C blocks. And the entropy trace rho log rho in terms of this reduced density matrix can be expressed in terms of the eigenvalues of this operator, again, involving this um, C matrix and its different blocks in this combination. As this final expression below um, in terms of a sum over um, logs of different combinations of the eigenvalues of this operator. So we can use this formula to go ahead and compute the entanglement entropy for this uh, chain of harmonic oscillators. But what answer do we expect to get um, in this system? We can compare to uh, CFT results for the entanglement entropy for a shorter line segment within a longer one containing it. And such systems have been uh, extensively studied and analytic results exist for them. For massless theory, for example, and a sub interval with two boundaries across which there's entanglement, the entropy takes the asymptotic form and the limit of the UV cutoff going to zero of 
this expression where curly L is the length of the subinterval whose entanglement we're interested in and um, capital L is the length of the entire interval. This one third uh, coefficient of the log is universal and it becomes uh, one over six if the subchain has only one boundary across which there's entanglement. This C1 constant is non-universal and it depends on the details of the system and our specific choices for the UV and infrared cutoffs. In the limit where the, the length of the uh, subinterval is much smaller than the length of the whole system, the entropy simplifies to this expression. So one third log of the interval length and in units of the cutoff plus the non-universal constant. And in, so in, in two dimensions, the, pan, the boundary is zero dimensional, but the same arguments that lead to the area law scaling in higher dimensions give rise to a log scaling in two dimensions. So this is considered to be consistent with an area law scaling in two dimensions. Can I ask a question? Yes. Ah, for identical particles, this method will not work, no? Because one has to take the symmetrized tensor product of the uh, vector states. So this is factorized like that. For um, identical particles. So, so this works for any bosonic theory. What no, I'm you are done. But the quantum state is, has to be symmetrized completely. So one cannot write it as a... Uh, product of a state localized in one region with another region. So one cannot take a partial trace. Um, so, so, so the way the tracing is happening is, um, uh, so, so we're just, um, the, the tracing is being done by restricting the indices to be those of the degrees of freedom that we are considering. Even the so, localized, so the, the localized observables are totally symmetrized. So again, one doesn't have the factorization of the observables because of the symmetrization or anti-symmetrization, if you like. You get so, slated with the for fermions. So in the, in the system that you have in mind, I, I'm not familiar with it, but okay. um, what would the degrees of freedom be counted with? Would it, yeah. So I, I guess I'm, I'm re reviewing a real space treatment and in, in your example, that's probably not the um, appropriate treatment, but what would be the appropriate treatment of the degrees of freedom of the system you have in mind? Uh, can I say something? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm answering Val's question. There is no assumption in Raphael's work about the, about the identity of the uh, harmonic oscillator. So the, what she's describing is Raphael's work. There is no assumption of identity there. Yes, I know Kumar. He ignores this issue. But yeah. it looks to me that it is significant. She is dealing with a quite with a essentially a a chain of uh, of harmonic oscillators. I, I think you want to deal with a quite a different system. No, it is the same system, but suppose the harmonic oscillators are identical, bosonic or fermionic, then even in quantum mechanics, for example, if it is fermionic, one gets the slater determinant for the wave functions. Then it is in fact the Hilbert space, which is a subspace of the tensor product. This not factorize. Well, Val, I, I suppose you just take as uh, your base two, two copies of the space with the identification of points. The, the space of states is what is relevant. So you take the space of states, symmetric, so two copies of space time with uh, things, but I don't think that uh, the reasoning will go. This is for uh, 
basically one particle being somewhere. If you have two particles being somewhere, if it's identical particle, uh, this possible spatial state is different. If the, in fact, this is fermionic, it's anti-symmetric, this is bosonic. But I think that uh, uh, this will go changing normalism, slight change in normalism. But this is valid yeah, also if the isn't, isn't it just like a single particle in one dimension? Example. I mean, these indices are labeling's position in one dimension, aren't they? We have done this calculation by, uh, by restricting the state, not by tracing it, to subalgebras. Okay? Yes. Then that, that answer was different from partial tracing. So the two things were not the same. The restriction is well defined, and one can find the entropy by using this um, uh, GNS construction. Okay. So we did that, and that was different from partial tracing. But okay. anyway, very good. Uh, we can come back to it uh, at the end. Later, of the yeah. okay. Right. So so let's now go back to our. Um, our oscillator chain, I'm setting periodic boundary conditions on the full chain. So the massless theory will have a zero mode, which will need to be regulated. And I'll do this by setting the mass to be some small but finite value. Then using the formula I reviewed earlier, the entropy can be computed for different spacings of the oscillators or different lengths of the subchain and we get the following scaling of the entanglement entropy in terms of um, curly L and the, the UV cutoff A. So we see that it agrees with the um, expected logarithmic scaling with the length of the subchain in units of the spatial distance A. And we have the scaling coefficient in agreement with the universal one third value. Okay, so the, this oscillator chain calculation that I just reviewed was an example of an entanglement entropy calculation set up fully spatially on the chain and using a spatial cutoff, which was the spacing between the different oscillators. And this works just fine for that system and many other similar systems that we're interested in. However, in, in a lot of applications in quantum field theory and ultimately quantum gravity, it's desirable to set up the calculation in space time and work with a space time cutoff. The horizons we're primarily interested in studying, for example, in gravitational settings are intrinsically global and space time objects. And we'd like to ask questions about them in a space time way. Also in general curved space times, there isn't necessarily a preferred hypersurface and spatial cutoff to work with. And the answers we get for the entanglement entropy would depend on what choice we make for these. So it's better to find a more covariant description that is free of these ambiguities. Besides concerns for, from a gravity standpoint, quantum fields themselves are often highly singular and may not always admit uh, meaningful restrictions to spatial hypersurfaces. I'll say a bit more about this in the next slide. And also in causal set theory, which is the approach to quantum gravity, which I work on and which uh, provides a fundamental discreteness scale as a covariant cutoff, one requires a space time framework for entanglement entropy because the notion of data on a Cauchy surface is absent. So here's an illustration of how a quantum field can be singular if it's described in a spatial domain only. Consider the normal ordered phi square operator and smear it with a test function with compact support on a constant time slice. Then square the result and compute its expectation value in the Minkowski vacuum. The resulting expression shown here diverges linearly. If we instead had smeared up here with a function, with a test function with compact support on a region of space time, 
namely a four-dimensional volume, we wouldn't get such a divergence. And we can repeat this exercise for other nonlinear operators, such as a stress tensor. Expressions like this occur, for example, in operator product expansions. And we can see from, from this that such quantities um, live more happily in space-time. Causal set theory is another motivation for form formulating entanglement entropy and quantum field theory in general in a space-time way. Let me briefly review causal sets for anyone who's not familiar with them. So causal set theory is an approach to quantum gravity where the deep structure of space-time is discrete. Formally, a causal set is a locally finite, partially ordered set. The set, let's call it C, is the set of space-time elements. And the order relation is the causal relation between these elements, which says which elements causally precede which other elements. The set and the relation satisfy a number of uh, conditions listed here. We have reflexivity so that each element is causally related to itself. We have anti-symmetry so that if an element X precedes element Y, then element Y precedes X, then they must be the same element. And this eliminates closed causal loops. We have transitivity. If element X precedes element Y and element Y precedes element Z, then X causally precedes Z as well. And finally, we have local finiteness, which means that there are a finite number of elements in the causal interval or diamond between each pair of elements. The first three conditions are satisfied by the causal structure of continuum space times as well. And the last condition is special to um, the discrete causal set. And the basis for founding the theory on these principles is that a classical space-time is fully described by the conformal metric, which contains the causal structure or light cone structure information of the space-time, plus a conformal factor, which is a volume measure. In the causal set, the causal relations give us the information normally in the conformal metric. And the finite number of elements in a space-time region give the volume measure or conformal factor piece of information. And this is why in causal sets, you might sometimes hear the slogan order plus number equals geometry. Here are some examples of very small and very simple causal sets represented by their Hasse diagrams, which means that causal relations that are not implied by transitivity are drawn in as lines and time goes upwards. For example, in this uh, first diagram, A causally precedes B and B causally precedes F. So by transitivity, A also causally precedes F, but an extra line isn't drawn in to show that. The development of causal set dynamics is a work in progress, but meanwhile, we can generate causal sets that are manifold-like and that are approximated by any space-time we wish to consider through a process called sprinkling. A sprinkling uh, places points randomly according to a Poisson distribution in a given uh, Lorentzian manifold with a density sigma. In this uh, distribution, the probability of having n elements in a region of space-time volume V is given by this expression. This distribution also ensures that on average, the number of elements in a space-time region is proportional to the uh, space-time volume and equal to it if the sprinkling is at unit density. Here's an example of a sprinkling into a causal diamond in one plus one dimensional Minkowski space-time. This causal set, in contrast to a regular lattice, is Lorentz invariant. So if we boost this interval, the distribution of elements is going to look more or less the same. In other words, uh, the points will look 
roughly uniformly and randomly distributed without any dramatically overdense or underdense regions. Now let me finally introduce and discuss the space-time definition of entanglement entropy for a Gaussian bosonic or scalar field theory in terms of the space-time correlation functions. Since the theory is Gaussian, everything, even the entropy, can be fully determined in terms of the space-time two-point function. And this is exactly what this definition does. Specifically, the entropy is given by this sum over lambda of lambda log absolute value lambda, where lambda is the solution to this generalized eigenvalue problem involving W, which is the space-time two-point function or Whiteman function, and uh, I delta, which is a space-time commutator, and is related to uh, W by being twice its imaginary part, or equivalently, its uh, anti-symmetric part. We can also get um, I delta by the difference between the retarded and advanced green functions. So because W and delta are space-time functions, this is a space-time formulation, in our entanglement entropy calculations, when we want to exclude parts that we don't have access to, we just need to restrict uh, the points x and x prime to lie within the space-time region that we do have access to. In the continuum, we can covariantly define a UV cutoff by choosing it to be a minimum eigenvalue of delta. Um, even though this is covariant, it wouldn't have a fundamental or universal meaning unless we understood the meaning of the spectrum of I delta better. Also, it has dimensions of area, so we need to know more about it in order to convert that to a length cutoff. On the other hand, in the causal set, the discreteness scale gives us a covariant cutoff, which does have a fundamental and universal meaning. And when this calculation is done in the causal set, W and delta are finite dimensional matrices, and we get a finite um, entropy S from this sum. For the original derivation, which made use of requirements such as unitarity and dimensionlessness of entropy to determine the combinations of correlators that would enter this formula, I refer, I refer you to this um, paper of Raphael Sorkin. I'll next instead show using the replica trick how we can see that this formula captures the entanglement entropy. Well, the field theory problem can be broken up into a sum of entropies of single degrees of freedom. The most general Gaussian density matrix for a single degree of freedom in position basis looks like this, where n is a normalization fixed by the condition that the trace of rho should be equal to one, and where we have uh, all possible quadratic terms symmetric in Q and Q prime. This B term ends up not contributing to the entanglement entropy. Now remember that for the replica trick, we need the nth power of the density matrix. Computing it uh, for this uh, Gaussian density matrix after some algebra, we get uh, this expression in terms of mu, which is some combination of the um, A and C parameters. Next, uh, taking the nth derivative and the limit of n going to one, we get that the entanglement entropy is equal to this expression, mu log mu plus one minus mu log one minus mu over one minus mu, where remember, Mu is just some combination of the A and C parameters. Now let's look at what delta and W look like for our single degree of freedom. 
they are these two by two matrices in terms of these expectation values, which after computing them become constants involving the A and C parameters. And after some algebra, we can see that uh, this expression 17 is e exactly equivalent to this uh, sum lambda log absolute value lambda with lambda given by the solutions to this generalized um, eigenvalue problem. So, sorry, is it easy to see the delta? Is this it's just this um, anti-symmetric matrix? Yeah, so, um, so remember delta is the or twice the imaginary part of the um, two-point function, essentially the space-time commutator. Yeah, okay. So the, these, um, these two terms give you the, the commutator between Q and P. Okay, so moving on to using this formula now. Um, entanglement entropy, as I mentioned, is defined with respect to an initially pure state. There is a covariantly defined Whiteman function called the sorkin johnston or SJ Whiteman function and corresponding vacuum state, which provide a pure state for this space-time entanglement entropy. In many cases, such as in bounded regions of space-time, this commutator I delta is a self-adjoint operator. So its eigenspectrum comes in pairs of positive and negative eigenvalues and their respective eigenfunctions. So we have uh, such an expansion in terms of them. And the SJ Whiteman function, which defines the SJ state, is defined by the restriction to the positive eigenspace of I delta. When we define W in this way, the only solutions to this uh, generalized eigenvalue problem are lambda equal to zero or one. And this makes the entropy vanish as required if the state is pure. Equivalently, we can uh, define this SJ Whiteman function by requiring these three conditions to be satisfied. So that its anti-symmetric part agree with the commutator and that it be uh, positive, both of which are satisfied by any Whiteman function. And thirdly, that it satisfy this orthogonal support condition, which is the distinguishing property of the state. Also worth mentioning is that in static space times, this SJ vacuum is the same one that's picked out by the time-like and hypersurface orthogonal killing vector. So it, it does reflect the symmetries of the background geometry, if there are any. So let's look at an application of this uh, space-time entanglement entropy formula to a scalar field in a smaller causal diamond within a larger one in two-dimensional Minkowski space-time. This is the space-time analog of the CFD intervals and chain of harmonic oscillator example I reviewed earlier. And the setup is shown in this um, picture over here. Delta and W, um, which is the SJW, look like this. Uh, U and V are light cone Minkowski light cone coordinates. And these are heavy side theta functions. So delta is only non-zero if one of the points is within the other's light cone. W looks like the minkowski whiteman function with an infrared cutoff. These later uh, constant parts reflect the infrared cutoff. Similar to the example of the chain of harmonic oscillators with uh, periodic boundary conditions, the massless scalar field theory in infinite space-time has an infrared divergence, which needs to be regulated and which is regulated in this uh, system by making the larger diamond or capital L have a finite size. 
And the results I will show in the next uh, couple of slides were obtained uh, from a calculation where the ratio of the diameters of these two diamonds was set to 0 0.01. Now to carry out the uh, calculation, we represent W and delta as finite matrices in the eigenbasis of I delta, which consists of two sets of plane wave linear combinations. These are the F and G functions defined here. The eigenvalues for both uh, of these functions are L over K, where K is the wave number and for the F set it's given by n pi over L. For the G set it's a little more complicated. It's solutions to this transcendental equation which in the limit of large wave numbers um, essentially becomes the same n pi over L expression as the other set. The UV cutoff is this uh, maximum wave number that we keep in the representation of W and delta. So in the, in the calculations, we keep the sizes of the diamonds fixed and we vary the, um, vary the value of the maximum wave number. Because the image of the space-time commutator is equal to the kernel of the wave equation, this is another reason why it's natural to interpret the cutoff in this way. Because with the modes, eigenmodes we've retained, we can expand Cauchy data of wavelengths uh, longer than one over this uh, maximum wave number. So here's the final result for the scaling of the entanglement entropy versus the UV cutoff, which is um, in length units one over the maximum wave number, along with the um, fit, which agrees very well with what we expect. We have a logarithmic scaling with the UV cutoff and a coefficient consistent with the universal one third value. We can repeat the very same calculation in a causal set. Here's a figure showing the analogous causal set set up. One difference in this case is that the discreteness scale is the UV cutoff. So W and delta are automatically finite size matrices whose dimension is given by the square of the number of elements that we sprinkle. We can get delta from the retarded green function, which for the massless theory is just one half the causal matrix, which is a matrix with ones where distinct points are causally related. For the Whiteman function, we uh, use the SJ Whiteman function. This plot below shows the Whiteman function in the causal set along with the continuum theory one that I showed you earlier both versus proper time or proper distance. The solid black line is the uh, continuum one while the blue scatter of points is the causal set values. So the two agree fairly well with one another and the starting point is um, fairly similar in the continuum and causal set. So we hold the volumes of the two diamonds fixed and we vary the number of elements that we sprinkle into them. That's how we vary the cutoff. So our cutoff in length dimensions scales as the square root of the number of elements. And here's a result of the scaling of the entanglement entropy with the UV cutoff. Again, we see that the entropy agrees with the expected uh, logarithmic scaling with a coefficient consistent with one third. Sorry about the sound. <laughs> um, there is some scatter um, in, in the causal set result because of uh, fluctuations that exist in the Poisson distribution of the uh, causal set points um, across different sprinklings. Also, uh, along with the collaborators listed here, we've also studied um, the entanglement entropy for causal sets approximated by De Sitter spacetime. 
So here's an example of a sprinkling of one plus one dimensional global de Sitter space time represented as an embedding in one higher dimension. The left figure is the sprinkling using the conformal metric above. And the figure on the right is with the conformal factor included. So because we can only work with a finite number of elements computationally, we don't sprinkle the infinite volume global de Sitter space time where um, this capital T goes from minus pi over two to pi over two. Instead, we consider a finite slab where the maximum value of, um, maximum absolute value of capital T would be some, some value smaller than pi over two. For example, in this specific case, it was chosen to be 1.2. So we considered the entanglement entropy between the horizon of a static observer at the North Pole and its causal complement. These uh, causally complementary regions are illustrated by these left and right wedges in this conformal diagram. And it's the entanglement entropy between these two wedges which we want to study. These dashed lines in the um, top and bottom represent the boundaries of the finite slabs that we consider. And on the right is the result for the scaling of the entanglement entropy with the UV cutoff and four space-time dimensions. So in, in four dimensions, the discreteness length scales as the fourth root of the number of sprinkled elements. And so an area law would mean a scaling proportional to the square root of n, which is what we see in this uh, plot. The, the curve is the best fit to the data and the entropy for both the left and right wedge is shown in the figure. But because they're basically identical, you see only one curve. This also means we trivially have complementarity. The numbers in this box um, are the best fit parameters on their uncertainties. However, there are no universal coefficients to compare to in 4D, only scaling laws. And we see that we have the area law scaling in this case. So far, everything I've talked about has been for a Gaussian theory, where everything is determined from the space-time two-point correlation function, W. Extensions of the kinds of methods that I've been talking about to interacting theories, or even free non-Gaussian theories, is quite challenging because generically all higher order endpoint functions will contribute. There's no intermediate context to study where you would have more than the two-point function, but a finite set of correlators contribute. We're faced with incorporating the full set of endpoint correlation functions. So along with the collaborators listed below, we studied this problem perturbatively to try and get a handle on what sort of extension um, is possible um, of, the, of such um, entanglement entropy formulae. And we found surprisingly that the first order and iteration theory, the same formula of the Gaussian theory, this um, sum over lambda of lambda log lambda with lambda given by this, uh, actually uh, captures the entire um, entanglement entropy for all theories, including um, interacting and non-Gaussian, but just up to um, first order and perturbation theory with W and Delta in this case, replaced by their perturbation corrected counterparts. And for simple in interactions where analytic calculations are possible, one can repeat the replica trick exercise I reviewed earlier to see that the first order contribution to the entanglement entropy will be captured by the, um, this space-time formula. 
But more generally, we can see this through the first law of entanglement entropy. So looking at the um, first order correction to the um, entanglement entropy, we can see that only uh, quadratic expectation values will enter. So this, this term vanishes and um, H is the modular Hamiltonian minus log rho. Uh, and so the first order um, correction only consists of uh, quadratic terms. Similarly, we can look at uh, the second order contribution and this time we can see that it will no longer consist of quadratic terms only and non-Gaussian contributions will enter specifically uh, through this uh, second term here. The primes in all these um, expressions are derivatives with respect to epsilon, which is parameterizing the perturbation away from a Gaussian state. And in this paper, we uh, expressed the second order term, this uh, second order contribution to the entanglement entropy as a series in terms of all the space-time endpoint correlation functions, although we didn't uh, fully work out all the coefficients. So there are many um, interesting and important future directions to take these studies. In the Gaussian case, an ultimate goal is to study black hole entropy, although such uh, black hole entanglement entropy calculations in the continuum are challenging computationally. And the expression for uh, W in a causal set black hole is not currently known. So some of these difficulties would need to be overcome to make this feasible. I only talked about uh, bosonic theories. Extensions of this work to fermionic theories is also possible. And it's something I'm currently working on with Ian Job, who is here. In um, interacting theories, it would be nice to apply the formula that we now hold up to first order and perturbation theory to study the entanglement entropy in both continuum geometries and discrete causal sets. Uh, further work can also be carried out to express the higher order contributions to the entanglement entropy in terms of space-time correlations. And finally, while the space-time formulations of entanglement entropy that I've been talking about have a space-time nature, they're still fixed, they're still tied to a fixed uh, space-time or causal set background. And we would ultimately like to go beyond this and find a space-time formulation that could incorporate the dynamic uh, space-time and causal structure likely to be necessary in quantum gravity. So just to uh, conclude, um, entanglement entropy has many important applications in various uh, fields of physics. In quantum field theory and gravitational settings especially, it is desirable to have a space-time formulation of entanglement entropy. And I reviewed such a space-time formulation of entanglement entropy, which is in terms of the space-time two-point correlation function. Um, it captures the entanglement entropy fully for Gaussian theories and up to first order in perturbation theory for all other theories such as interacting and non-Gaussian free theories. And some future directions in this context include um, trying to make progress in studying the entanglement entropy of a scalar field in a causal set or continuum black hole background, as well as further studying um, the entanglement entropy of interacting theories and casting some of the higher order contributions to the entanglement entropy in a perturbative treatment 
in terms of the um, endpoint correlation functions. So thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for an excellent talk, uh, Yasmin. Um, these, the applause tends to be rather silent in this format, <laughs> but I, I will throw the uh, uh, floor open to discussion. Uh, questions, anyone? You can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Yasmin, did one of your slides say, refer to the first law of entanglement entropy? Yes. <laughs> I've never heard that phrase before. Do you want to explain what that means? Is there a zero law and a second law as well? Um, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> I, uh, this was something that was, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just know the first law. <laughs> and it, it's used a lot in these um, perturbative treatments to compute the first order correction, but. Um, I mean, is it meant I, to suggest the laws of some, you know, the laws of some of that? Is that, is it have anything to do with that? Is that what, do you know? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a term used by other people, I presume, rather than when you invented yourself, Yasmin. Right. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question, Lindy? Yeah, Kumar. Yes, welcome to the uh, to this. Your sound is a little bit low, but uh, we... ah, okay. Like, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is: first of all, thanks for the nice talk, and. Uh, when you are discussing this Gaussian states, let's say the bosonic one, because the fermionic one you said is work in progress. In the bosonic case, uh, do you have a concept of the reduced density matrix and its relation to the entanglement Hamiltonian in the context of the space-time uh, uh, theories that you're describing? Is there a concept of the entanglement Hamiltonian? Um. Let's see. Oops. Uh, where did I should go? Right. Um. So, so because we we typically define um, where is it? So we define our vacuum state. Um, using this um, SJ prescription. So it's not immediately clear that there is some kind of um, Hamiltonian uh, that could be associated to it, but it's possible that you, um, that you could cook up a, a Hamiltonian that would um, always end up being minimized by this choice of um, vacuum state, it's not clear that such a thing exists, so I don't know. Um, yeah. Now maybe uh, my question was not about that. See, what I meant is that uh, take an ordinary fermionic theory, for example, on a lattice, right? So suppose you do a reduced density matrix and you can relate the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix to the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, right? That's the whole basis of this work, I suppose. That's this old work of special. And there you can write the reduced density matrix as exponential of minus h, where h is called the entanglement Hamiltonian. So I was asking if there is a concept of that in the context of the space time theory. Right. So, I mean, I think that that would be related to this. And I don't know, it's possible that there is there is such a description or such a connection that could be made, but it hasn't been made yet, but we haven't tried to make it either, so. Okay, thanks. Um, so people call it, there's another term for that, people call it the modular Hamiltonian. Right. I presume that's the same thing or it's very closely related. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, but, yeah the, but the, we do know in, in one case at least it is, the SJ vacuum is the ground state of that modular 
Hamiltonian, and that's the case of the Rindler wedge. So if you're reduced density matrix, so you take the Minkowski vacuum in Minkowski space and you reduce it by restricting it to the just one one Rindler wedge. And then you the modular Hamiltonian in that case is just the one that generates the boosts, you know, the the um, translations in time, which are the, you know, the um, whose who's height, you know, the whose the slices of, of t equal of you know that time equals constant are just these um, uh, I don't know how you describe it, just um, spatial surfaces which are all tied to a you know to the corner of the wedge that the ground state of that is this is this sj vacuum in that case in that one case so what the relationship between the sj vacuum and the ground state of the modular hamiltonian is in general we don't know and Although I think we have a counterexample to this conjecture that they're actually the same, which is the example that Yasman showed, which is just the single wedge in one plus one dimensions for a massless scalar field. That's a peculiar and rather singular case anyway, because the massless theory in one plus one dimensions, you know, is it is singular. You know, it has this UV, uh, sorry, uh, infrared divergence, but uh, and in that case, I think we know that the SJ state is not, it's not the ground state of the modular Hamiltonian. Can I but, make a remark on this? Yeah. The, yes, Paul, go ahead. Yeah. In, uh, for, for example, for the Riddler wedge, and in fact, for all local algebras, let, the remarks are from quantum field theory part. So take all the local algebras, any local algebra. It is what is called type 3 one. And one knows that the modular Hamiltonian is not bounded above or below ever. Okay. Uh, this is uh, um, the code spectrum of the modular Hamiltonian extends from minus infinity to plus infinity. It includes also the origin, the spectrum. Okay. This is known and uh, goes into the classification of type 3 1. Okay. So I want to ask from again from the quantum field theory point of view. I, I don't want to remember. In the, uh, for example, in the Raphael approach, the I, one knows that because of the positivity of energy, there is no localized state okay, in quantum field theory. There is no projection operator, unlike in quantum mechanics, to space time localized regions. It doesn't exist. And that comes essentially from the positivity of energy and some analyticity properties. Okay. So what one not, can do, for example, you take the real wedge. I don't know what is the meaning of uh, 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 taking a trace for the other part because the Hilbert space doesn't split like that. Okay? One can restrict the algebra to the Rindler wedge, but to get entanglement, presumably between Rindler wedge and the causal complement, this one can uh, look what happens. You can compute the relative entropy, for example, but that diverges because of the corner where the two things touch. Okay? So uh, that uh, there is a uni apparently a universal divergence. I think it is of the same form that uh, 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 someone wrote down. Okay, there is, it is some universal divergence one can write down. Okay? So it is not very clear. Normally, what is done in uh, quantum field theory context is to split the corners. That is, they have the split property. So you, you remove the things by a little bit, then one can compute the relative entropy. Okay? Uh, that is well defined between the two regions, and there is this relative modular Hamiltonian, and one can do. So it is not very clear what is going on here okay, in connection with quantum field theory, at least to me. Okay. Um, essentially, because these partial traces, I don't know what they mean in quantum field theory. Okay. Maybe there is a meaning. Okay. In quantum mechanics, there is a meaning, but again, for identical particles, one gets into trouble. So it is not very clear to me this how this situation fits into the program of quantum field theory people. Okay? And there is also a remark which was overcome by uh, which Raphael knows very well. 
that these states that Rafael Jordison uh, sort of Um, have I, um, I think we lost Val. I think we lost Val, yeah. I was wondering whether it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we got his point anyway. So um, if uh, Yasemin wants to come back on that. Um, I'm not sure what you can say about it. <laughs> I guess. Maybe one one comment is that um, a, as far as I I'm familiar with these arguments, um, these issues seem to be um, seem to exist strictly for the um, infinite um, infinite degree of freedom or infinite dimensional QFTs. That these um, splitting issues with the type three. Um, von Neumann algebras occur, but for for entanglement and entropy purposes, we're only ever um, concerned with um, a finite number of degrees of freedom. Anyway, we have we have to set a UB cutoff one way or another, which will make um, which will reduce the the infinite number of degrees of freedom to a finite one. And as far as I know, these, these issues um, no longer exist for a finite number of degrees of freedom. They could be related to ultraviolet divergences and probably only dual re-emerging in, in the context of ultraviolet divergence, but your, your entropy is going to be divergent anyway if you have ultraviolet divergences of its own. So it seems difficult to disentangle them. I think you are muted. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as well? uh, can I just ask yes, a question go ahead. about the answer that was given to my previous question? So, uh, in terms of modular Hamiltonian, uh, as uh, was pointed out, there exists a modular Hamiltonian in a particular example here. Um, so my question is that would the exponential of that modular Hamiltonian describe a mixed state? In this particular, or in that particular case, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so my question is that, see, when you are relating, how do you calculate entanglement entropy from correlation function? What normally is done that the, the eigenvalues of the correlation function are related to the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, right? That's the basic philosophy. So, and the way uh, that is done is through this entanglement Hamiltonian. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the, you, 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 when you go to the subsystem, the subsystem mm -hmm. is defined by a density matrix, which is a mixed state, which is related to the entanglement Hamiltonian by exponentiation. So e to the power minus h roughly is the density matrix. So my question is that in this kind of system where that uh, kind of Hamiltonian exists, which were related to the modular Hamiltonian, uh, does one know about the eigenstates or the spectrum of that modular Hamiltonian? Does one have an idea about the spectrum of that modular Hamiltonian? Yes. So, so, the, so the ingredients in, in the calculation are, are different. It, it's still, it's still a, it's a trace row log row entropy, but we've, um, we've repackaged that initial um, pure row in terms of these correlation functions. So then when we do the reduction by um, restricting the, the points in the correlations to be in this uh, reduced region, we haven't gone back to now construct the reduced density matrix to be able to talk about the quantities that you're asking about. It could be done, but we don't need it for the calculation and we haven't done that to be able to directly answer these questions. So we're working with these, um, with these reduced um, correlators, which um, 
presumably have a reduced density matrix corresponding to them, but we haven't constructed that reduced density matrix. Can I make a remark on this? Kumar, can yeah. you ask ahead, about, yeah. Yeah. The, for the local quantum field theory, there are no pure states. The, for example, the vac vacuum state or any state in the, coming from the Fox space, restricted to the local quantum field theory, is a KMS state. And the KMS Hamiltonian is the boost operator K or K1 or whatever, okay? It's exactly that boost operator. So all these are mixed. And one knows that the uh, state is, it is like, um, how do I say, uh, like group theory. You know, if you take the regular representation, every representation occurs, irreducible representation occurs as often as its dimension. Here, the representation of the algebra is, uh, there is a, uh, committant of this algebra, which also acts uh, on the, K, the GNS states. And it's a highly entangled state, okay? A priori, there is no pure state. And the states are KMS states. All these states are KMS states, okay? Uh, so, I don't, I don't know how to get, get, get a pure state. It doesn't exist. Okay? Vacuum state becomes impure. Okay? One Sorry, more in, in what context, well, can you clarify that? I'm not... Uh, I'm... Sorry? In what context is, are all states uh, KMS states? Ah, because of this, how, do, how does one analyze the local algebras? For example, one takes a vacuum state. Okay? The vacuum is expectation value with regard to the vacuum on the local algebras are well defined. So that defines a state. Yes. So, but you want to know where, what is the nature of this state by trying to write it in terms of extremal states then apply Shannon's formula for entropy. Okay? So what do you do? You do a GNS construction. But the GNS, the, the, the state from the basic vector state from which you induce the GNS state, GNS construction is cyclic and separating. Then this Tomita Takesaki says that uh, on this thing, you know, the, the commutant of this algebra, which is isomorphic to the algebra, is Fortnumman algebra, also acts. Okay? Uh, and the whole thing is extremely entangled and one can analyze it quite easily using this Tomita theory and you find that this is a KMS state. Okay? KMS, uh, are, are KMS states thermal states? The KMS in the sense that if you cyclically, it is not cyclic, uh, it is not a tracial state, so you cannot cyclically permute, you get the extra factor exponential minus beta k. Okay? So, so beta, that comes, where uh, is beta coming in this computation? Uh, in this, yeah. So you take this vacuum expectation value of two local operators, A and B, okay, in this region. Then you try to write B in, and A, but you don't get A, B, and the imaginary time translation of A with the boost Hamiltonian. Yes. The, with the boost, which is K, okay? the uh, Tomita model Hamiltonian. So it is KMS. All these uh, local algebras are KMS, okay? but the KMS Hamiltonian will change. Uh, one more remark. If you take, a, one takes a space-time space region okay, and you have a local algebra and you take another region which is causally connected to this one by time evolution, though the algebras are exactly the same because the time evolution provides for you the, uh, the isomorphism between the two algebras. So the algebras are exactly the same. Okay? So restriction of a state to either of these algebras will give the same value. Okay? There is no... Okay. So, one normally considers costly complete regions. Okay? So, so uh, for example, the double diamond. Okay? So that is a costly complete region, then you take the causal complement. So uh, it is meaningful only to discuss such complementary regions because of the, this, uh, I think, time slices axiom. Okay? So that's a remark because I didn't see it being discussed. Two regions are connected by time evolution. They have, have the same entropy, okay? same everything up to unitary transformations. So just a remark. Okay. So, and one cannot compute trace row log row because they are all row, if there, is, there is no finite dimensional density matrix to take trace. It will diverge. Okay. But the KMS property is fulfilled. Hello? Yeah, yeah hello, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, What's a remark? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think we get your remark. Yeah. But I don't know what happens in the causal set. Um, it is a different uh, point of view. I don't know what happens. It's a, it should be a limit of the uh, when the cutoff goes to uh, yeah. zero. But th these pro properties diverge as we discussed, and uh, it's kind of difficult to resolve. Anyway, I will leave Yasin and, and Faye, who know much more about these things, to answer. Mm. So can I ask about equation 21, which is on the screen here? I, I have a question about that equation. Yeah. So uh, what I wanted to know is how you relate the eigenvalue of the correlation function to the entanglement entropy. I know one method by this uh, entanglement Hamiltonian, but you are not using that. So what is the method you are using which relates the eigenvalues of the correlation function to the uh, S that is written on the screen also? Um, so, so do you mean, do you mean the eigenvalues of it? Th this is yeah, the eigenvalues yeah, yeah. of the correlation function in the um, in the full region. No, no, subregion. In the subregion. Yeah. Um, well, there. So, so these lambdas are the lambdas that go in the um, in the entropy formula. There isn't a a nice relation between the eigenvalues of either um, this this W or delta in the subregion and this, um, this lambda, um, simply because this is, a, this is a generalized eigenvalue problem. Um, or I guess you could, you could rewrite this as being the eigenvalues of the operator inverse delta W. So th there's no obvious, um, relation to the eigenvalues of either one of those in the subregion. Okay, but for the full region, you are saying there is a relation as written on your screen, right? Yes, if, if the W is chosen in this way, then there is this relation. How does one prove that? What is that? I mean, I'm not asking you to prove it. I'm just asking that what is the basic uh, philosophy in proving that thing? That the solutions are zero and one. No, no. The, oh. How to relate the lambda in W V to the lambda in S? So how do I know they're the same thing? Um. Oh, how uh, how to relate this to this? Yes. You mean? Yes. yes. So true. so this was um and I guess I tried to show it with the replica trick review that the um. The, the entropy in terms of those those parameters that I, I guess here. So we went through this um, replica trick calculation in terms of the density matrix of a single degree of freedom. And um, we found some combination of these these parameters which are related to expectation values of correlators. And then, um, uh, and th this is exactly equivalent to doing this other, um, this other eigenvalue problem and sum. So, so this this S, if I rewrite it in terms of mu, would would be identical to equation seventeen. Okay. Okay, I get the point. Okay, thank you. Can I ask? Can I ask? Uh, Go ahead, Giorgio. <laughs> you mentioned at the uh, yes, uh, you you mentioned at the end the uh, the entanglement uh, entropy for a black hole, but uh, you know that confuses me. What does a, the causal set um, corresponding to a space time with a black hole stuck in it look like? I have no idea. Um, so we we can make. We can sprinkle a um, causal set black hole, uh, or we can we can sprinkle a um, black hole background space time, and basically um, what the so so the, the causal relations would just have to agree with the causal relations between the the points would have to agree with um, the metric of whatever 
background black hole that you have. Yes. For example, you would need to have no um, relations going from inside the black hole to outside the black hole. And you would see, um, yeah, it, for, the, for the horizon, um, there, there is some, some analog of um, something like a horizon, which is called um, an anti-chain, which is just a, a, set of, a, a set of maximal points that have no relations among them. Um, so, so you would, you would see yeah. something like that emerging. Yes, I, mean, I thought of a black hole, something out, out of which nothing comes. So, I mean, you know, there should be no, no, nothing being uh, caused by a black right. hole. No. Right, so, so no causes from yeah. inside to outside. Uh, I'm sorry, I also have another question, which is of more historical nature. Uh, the word entanglement was invented by Schrodinger, uh, uh, in in discussing the Einstein Podolsky Rosen uh, um, paper, uh, then it was never mentioned. Uh, Schrodinger thought it was the most important thing about quantum mechanics, most characteristic thing about quantum mechanics, but it got, never got mentioned again. In fact, most book, all the books I looked at, in, you know, basic books in quantum mechanics, haven't even got the word in the index. You see, so. Am I correct in saying that uh, the notion of entanglement was resurrected by Raphael in his paper about the black hole and <laughs> about the interpretation of black hole entropy? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think Faye, Faye may know the answer. I don't mean. I don't think he used the phrase entanglement entropy, although, of course, it's the con this concept. Yes, he certainly, right. it's it, it certainly due to him, I think, but, or at least, you know, the resurgence of interest in entanglement, yeah, is due to him. But I don't think he used the phrase entanglement entropy in that, mm -hmm. in that paper, yeah. that well, specific yeah. phrase. No, yes, Manny was saying that, uh, you know, the word entanglement appears in, you know, a number of papers after 2000, and what, after 19 something or other. And never before, I would add, you see. That's why I'm asking. Giorgio, how about Bell? Uh, Bell must have used it. Yeah, Bell may have used it, I don't really know. Oh, yes, of course, he, he must have used it, that's for sure, you know, because he certainly discussed, discussed the thing. But I mean, uh, as I say, quantum mechanics books never mention it, which is, uh, you know, rather puzzling under the circumstances, because now we think that that is, well, <laughs> the thing about quantum mechanics, you see. Never mind. We need a historian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not suitable for that, you see. Okay, I think I will stop the recording. Thank uh, Yasmin again, and we can um, continue in more casual fashion. Let's, yes, if you're unmuted, we can thank you. There. Sorry, I've got the microphone so that I can actually clap. <laughs> I think we, okay, so I'm going to stop the recording.